write in the missing numbers. First, we have something plus 75 equals 90. So whenever we have a missing number addition problem, we can always use subtraction to find the missing number. So we can work out 90 minus 75. We might be able to do that mentally, but if we use column subtraction, we can't do 0 minus 5, so go to the left, 1 less, 1 in front. 10 minus 5 is 5, 8 minus 7 is 1, so our missing number here is 15. Now, 4 times something equals 200. So we have a missing number multiplication problem, which means that we can divide to find the missing number. So work out 200 divided by 4. Again, we might be able to do that mentally, but if we use short division, 20 divided by 4 is 5, 0 divided by 4 is 0, so our missing number is 50. Circle one number in each box to make a total of 1000. So in this box we could have 450, and if we chose 200 from this box, 450 plus 200 is 650. So that means we need another 350 to get to 1000. Notice here, we can make number bonds to 1000 in the same way that we make number bonds to 100. So because 45 plus 20 plus 35 is 100, that means 450 plus 200 plus 350 will give us a total of 1000. We could also have 350, 400 and 250 because 350 plus 400 is 750 and then 250 more than that makes 1000. Or we could have 450, 400 and 150 because that makes a total of 1000. Here is a tile. The tile is turned. One of the diagrams below shows the tile after it has been turned. Tick the correct diagram. So what we need to do here is imagine turning this tile round and we can see that it now looks the same as this tile here. Kate has a piece of ribbon one meter long. She cuts off 30 centimeters how many centimetres of ribbon are left? So we need to know that one metre is the same as 100 centimetres. And because she cuts off 30 centimetres, we need to take 30 away from 100. So that means that 70 centimetres of ribbon are left. Here is part of a number sequence. The numbers increase by the same amount each time. So we have 750, 755, 760, 765, 770. The sequence continues. Circle all of the numbers below that would appear in the sequence. Well we can see that all of the numbers in the sequence are multiples of 5. That's numbers in the 5 times table. And we can tell that because our last digit is either a 0 or a 5. So the numbers in the sequence will be the numbers that end in 0 or 5. So that's 840, 905 and 1000. Here are three bags in a shop. How much does bag B cost to the nearest pound? So we can see that bag B is £14.65. And to round to the nearest pound, we find the digit before the decimal point, so our ones digit, and then, as always, when we're rounding, we look at the digit to the right. So that's our tenths or our ten pence digit. We have a six, and when we're rounding, if we have five or more, we round up. So that means this four is going to become a five. Digits to the left stay the same, so this 1 will stay the same, and this 4 will turn into a 5, 
so that's £15. Now, Jamie buys bag A and bag C. How much change does he get from £40? Well, first, we can find the total of what he spends, and then subtract that from £40 to get the change. So bag C costs £16.50, and bag A costs £11.50. So if we use column addition, we can work out that that's £28 altogether. So if he spends £28, but pays with £40, we can subtract what he spends, so subtract £28 from £40, and that tells us that he'll get £12 change. Class 6 launched some balloons at a school fete. This diagram shows how far some of the balloons travelled. How many balloons on the diagram travelled between 20 kilometres and 30 kilometres? So we can see that the school is marked with an X, and here we have a circle showing 20 kilometres, and here a circle showing 30. So the balloon that travelled between those distances will be the balloons that are between these two circles. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 balloons. Now estimate how far Hassan's balloon travelled. So Hassan's balloon is marked here. We can see that that's right in the middle of 30 kilometres and 40 kilometres. So the number in the middle of 30 and 40 is 35. So his balloon travelled 35 kilometres. Jamie makes a timeline of part of his day. What time does Jamie's morning break start? So the arrow for start of morning break is here. Now we can see that that's between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock. But to get from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock, to get from one hour to the next, we have one, two, three, four lines. So each of these lines is a quarter of an hour. So we have 10 o'clock plus 3 quarters of an hour. And 3 quarters of an hour is the same as 45 minutes. So Jamie's morning break starts at 10.45. If each line is a quarter of an hour, after 10 o'clock we have 10.15, then 10.30, and then the start of morning break must be at 10.45. Now, lunch lasts for three quarters of an hour. What time does lunch finish? Well, we can see that it starts right in the middle of 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. So that's half past 12 or 12.30. If we know that each line is 15 minutes, we have 12 o'clock, 12.15 and then 12.30. But it lasts for three quarters of an hour so lasts for 45 minutes. So from 12.30, if we add 30 minutes, that will take us to the next hour, so take us to 1 o'clock, because 30 plus 30 is 60, and there are 60 minutes in an hour. But that's adding 30 minutes, and we need to add 45 minutes, so we need another 15 minutes, because if we add 30 and then add 15, that's the same as adding 45. So, 15 minutes after 1 o'clock is 1.15, so that's the time that lunch finishes. We could also count on 3 quarters of an hour on our timeline. So remember, each of these little lines is a quarter of an hour. So if we count on 3, we can see that we have 1 o'clock plus another quarter of an hour, so that's 1.15. A torch costs £7.65. Kate buys a torch and two batteries. She pays £8.75 altogether. How much does one battery cost? Well, first of all, let's work out how much money Kate spent on two batteries. We know that she paid £8.75, but £7.65 of that was for a torch. So if we subtract £7.65 from £8.75, that gives us £1.10. So she spent £1.10 on two batteries, but we need to know the cost of one battery. So we need to divide by two. £1.10 
divided by 2 is £0.55 or 55 pence. And here we might need to use column subtraction and then short division to get our answer, but we get 55 pence. The chart shows the number of sunny days and the number of windy days in six months. Which month had more windy days than sunny days? So we can see that sunny days are pale grey and windy days are dark grey. So we're looking for months where the dark grey bar is larger because we're looking for months which had more windy days than sunny days. So for May, we can see that the number of windy days was larger. For June, sunny days is larger and it's larger for July, August and September. But for October, again, the dark grey bar is larger. So in October, we have more windy days than sunny days. So the two months are May and October. Now, how many months had more than 15 sunny days? So to get from 0 to 10, we have five lines, which means that each line must represent two days. So we have 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. So 15 will be right in the middle of 14 and 16, and also right in the middle of 10 and 20. Now we want the months with more than 15 sunny days. And remember, sunny days are pale grey. So for May, we can see that the number of sunny days is less than 15. But it's more for June and for July. It's more for August and for September. But not for October, because for October, we can see that the pale grey bar is not as many as 15. So that's a total of four months with more than 15 sunny days. How many more sunny days than windy days were there in June? So if we find the bars for June, we can see that there were 20 sunny days. And then for windy days, we have 13. Because remember, we're going up by two with each line. And we have what's in the middle of 12 and 14. So that's 13 windy days. Now the question says how many more? So we need to find the difference. Find how many more is 20 than 13. And to find the difference, we can subtract. 20 minus 13 is 7. So there were 7 more sunny days than windy days in June. Calculate 17 times 5 times 4. So we can multiply in any order. But if we start with 17 times 5, we can set this out as a short multiplication. 7 times 5 is 35, so 3, 5. 1 times 5 is 5, plus 3 is 8. So 17 times 5 is 85, but now we need to take that answer and multiply it by the other number in our question. 5 times 4 is 20, so 2, 0. 8 times 4 is 32, plus 2 is 34. So our answer is 340. Here are five patterns. For each pattern, put a tick if it has a line of symmetry, put a cross if it does not. So this first pattern has a line of symmetry here. That's a line down the middle of a shape where we can have the same reflected on both sides. But this pattern here does not have a line of symmetry. We could draw a line down the middle of the shape, but we wouldn't have the same reflected on both sides. We wouldn't be able to fold one side over so that it completely covered the other side with nothing overlapping. This pattern has a line of symmetry here, and this pattern a line of symmetry down the middle, so a vertical line of symmetry. But this pattern again does not have a line of symmetry we wouldn't be able to fold one side over the other so that nothing was overlapping. Here are two thermometers. They show two different temperatures. What is the difference between the two temperatures? So if we look at this thermometer here, we have 13 because each line is an increase of one degree 
and it's 3 above 10, so that's 13. And here on this thermometer, we can see that our arrow is pointing right at minus 5. So we need to find the difference between minus 5 and 13. If we start at minus 5, adding 5 will take us to 0, and then from 0 to get to 13, we just need to add 13. So to get from minus 5 to 13, we added 5, then added 13. So that's adding 18 altogether, which means the difference is 18 degrees. If you're finding the difference between a positive and a negative number, what you can do is just ignore any negative signs and add up the numbers that you have. So 13 plus 5 is 18, so the difference is 18 degrees. Here is a grid of regular hexagons. The shaded shape has an area of 3 hexagons and a perimeter of 14 centimeters. So we can see that this shape takes up 3 hexagons, so that's its area, and the perimeter is 14, because if we count the number of sides, and remember the sides are 1 centimeter, we can count 14 centimeters around the outside. Now we need to draw another shape on the grid which has an area of 4 hexagons and a perimeter of 14 centimeters. So we need the perimeter to be the same. So we can't have another straight line, but this time of 4 hexagons, because if we had this hexagon shaded as well, the perimeter would be longer. So we need to shade 4 hexagons like this. That way, the area is 4 hexagons, but if we count the distance around the outside, so we need to remember we're starting here, we can count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and now we're back where we started, so that's a perimeter of 14 centimeters. Write one number which fits all three of these statements. It is a multiple of 4, it is a multiple of 6, it ends in 8. So we need to remember that a multiple of a number is in that number's times tables. So multiples of 4 are numbers in the 4 times table, and multiples of 6 are numbers in the 6 times table. Now we need a number that is both a multiple of 4 and a multiple of 6, so we need a common multiple of 4 and 6 that also has to end in an 8. So we can have 48. That's a multiple of 4 because 12 times 4 is 48, and it's a multiple of 6 because 8 times 6 is 48 as well, and of course it ends in an 8, so we have our answer. Now, explain why a number which ends in 3 cannot be a multiple of 4. That's because multiples of 4 are always even numbers. They always end in 0, 2, 4, 6 or 8. Circle all the numbers that are greater than 0 0.6. So 0 0.5 will be less than 0 0.6 but 0 0.8 will be more or greater. But now we have 0 0.23, so we have a number with two digits after the decimal point, but we're comparing it to a number with only one digit after the decimal point. And when we're comparing decimals with a different number of decimal places, we can remember that we can write zeros on the end of decimal numbers without changing the value of the number. So 0 0.6 is the same as 0 0.60, and we can see that that's larger than 0 0.23. So 0 0.23 is not greater than 0 0.6, because it only has 2 tenths, and 0 0.6 has 6 tenths. And if we compare 0 0.09 and 0 0.6 or 0 0.60, 
again, we can see that this number here is smaller, not greater. But with 0 0.67, that is greater than 0 0.6. We have the same number of tenths, but 0 0.67 has an extra 7 hundredths, and 0 0.6 or 0 0.60 doesn't have any hundredths. Here are some shapes on a grid. Write the letter of each shape that has one pair of parallel sides. So we need to remember that parallel lines are like train tracks. If we extended them, they would go on forever without crossing. So we have parallel lines here, and also parallel lines on C, because if we extended these lines, they would never cross. So the shapes with parallel sides are A and C. A shop sells notebooks and pens. Hassan bought a notebook and a pen. He paid £1.10. Kate bought a notebook and two pens. She paid £1.45. Calculate the cost of a notebook. So Hassan bought a notebook and a pen and that was £1.10 altogether. Kate bought a notebook and two pens and she paid £1.45. So first, let's find out how much more Kate paid than Hassan. If we subtract £1.10 from £1.45, that gives us a difference of 35 pence. And for that extra 35 pence, Kate got one extra pen. So we know that the pens cost 35 pence. And knowing that means that we can calculate the cost of a notebook. If we look, Hassan spent £1.10. He got one pen. But if we subtract the cost of a pen, so subtract 35 pence from £1.10, that gives us 75 pence. So we know that notebooks must cost 75 pence each. So notice here, the only way that we could calculate the cost of a notebook was finding the cost of a pen first. Because if we look what was different about what Hassan and Kate bought, it was just that Kate bought an extra pen. So knowing that meant that we could work out how much a pen cost by working out how much more Kate paid. And then once we'd worked out the cost of a pen, we could subtract that from the total and that would give us the cost of a notebook. For each of these points, put a tick to show if it is inside the square. So first we have the coordinates 50, 70. So remember the first coordinate is the x coordinate and because we have 0 here and 80 here, 50 will be in line with about this point here. Then the y coordinate is 70, so if this point is 60, 70 will be just above that, so our point will be at about this point here, so we'll be outside the square because 70 is larger than 60. Now we have 60 minus 30. So an x coordinate of 60 will be at about this point here, and a y coordinate of minus 30, if this is 0 and this minus 40, minus 30 will be about here. So we can imagine that those points will cross at about this point, so the point will be inside the square. Now minus 10 as our x coordinate will be inside the square, because that's between 0 and minus 20, and then 50 as our y coordinate will be inside the square as well, because that's less than 60. So we'll have our point at about this point here, so that will be inside the square. And finally we have minus 30 minus 30. So an x coordinate of minus 30 will be outside the square, because if this point here is minus 20, minus 30 will be to the left of that. And then a y coordinate of minus 30 will be inside the square, but not if the x coordinate is minus 30 as well. 
so this point here will be outside of the square. Calculate 504 divided by 21. So first we can work out our 21 times table. 21 is of course 1 times 21. If we add another 21 to that, we get 42 for 2 times. Adding another 21 gives us 63 for 3 times. 84 is 4 times and we get 105 for 5 times. So now that we've got to 5 times, we can look back at our question and then only carry on if we need to. Taking the first two digits together, we have 50. So we need a number that's as close to 50 as possible, but not more than 50. So that's 42. We can write 42 below the 50, and because that's two times, we can write two in our answer line. So now we subtract and bring down. We can't do zero minus two, but 10 minus two is eight, four minus four is zero, and if we bring down the four, we have 84, which we can see is exactly four times. So that's four as the ones digit of our answer, 24. Two matchsticks have the same length as three bottle tops. How many bottle tops will have the same length as 50 matchsticks? So two matchsticks is the same as three bottle tops. But we want to know how many bottle tops is the same as 50 matchsticks. So we can think 2 times what is 50? Well 50 divided by 2 is 25. So that means 2 times 25 is 50. So to work out the number of bottle tops, we need to multiply 3 by the same. So work out 3 times 25. That gives us 75. So there will be 75 bottle tops, making the same length as 50 matchsticks. A cube has shaded shapes on three of its faces. Here is a net of the cube. Draw in the two missing shaded shapes. So we can see that the face at the top of the cube is this face here. And that means that this face is hidden because this face will be the face that's on this side. Now this face will fold around, so this edge will meet this edge. And this face is the face at the front. So on this face, we have a semicircle, so we need to draw our semicircle here. That way, when the two edges join together, we'll have a circle like we see here. And then when this face folds around, this face here will fold all the way around and cover this edge. So that's the face on the left of what we can see. So we have a rectangle on this face and we need to draw our rectangle here because this edge is going to meet with this edge here. So we have our two missing shaded shapes. Here are two spinners, A and B. Hassan spins the pointer on each spinner. He adds his two scores together. For each statement, put a tick to show if it is certain, possible or impossible. One has been done for you. So remember, certain means that it's definitely going to happen. Possible means that it might happen or might not. And impossible means that it definitely won't happen. So the total will be more than 15 is possible. Now we have the total will be an even number. So we can see that all of the numbers on spinner A are odd numbers and all of the numbers on spinner B are odd numbers as well. But he adds his two scores together. And if you have an odd number plus an odd number, you always get an even number. So that's certain. Now the total will be less than six. So we can see that the smallest number we have here is three and the smallest number on spinner B is five. But three and five give a total of eight and that's more than six. 
so it's impossible that the total of the two spinners will be less than 6. Now, the score on A will be less than the score on B. So we can see that the largest number we have on this spinner is 9, and the smallest on this one is 5. But 9 is not less than 5, so it's possible that you will get a larger number on this spinner on spinner A than on spinner B. So that's only possible, not certain. Part of this number line is shaded. Circle all the numbers below that belong in the shaded part of the number line. So on our number line, we can see that to get from one whole number to the next, we have one, two, three, four lines. So each line represents one quarter. So this point here is one and one quarter because it's one line after one. And this line here is one and two quarters. But it's useful to compare these to decimals, so to change them to decimals. One quarter is equivalent to 25 hundredths, so one and one quarter can be written 1.25 as a decimal. And two quarters is equivalent to 50 hundredths, so that's 1.5 or 1.50 as a decimal. So now we need to compare these numbers to 1.1 and 1.4. To do that, it's useful to write zeros on the end because we can always write zeros on the end of decimals without changing the value of the number. So because 1.10 is less than 1.25, it won't be in the shaded space. But 1.40 is between 1.25 and 1.50, so we can circle 1.4. Now we need to compare 1 and 1 third, but we have quarters, and to compare fractions we need the denominators to be the same. Now 12 is in both the 4 and the 3 times table. 1 third is equivalent to 4 twelfths, because 3 times 4 is 12, 1 times 4 is 4, and 1 and 1 quarter is equivalent to 1 and 3 twelfths. 4 times 3 is 12, 1 times 3 is 3. And now for 1 and 2 quarters, 4 times 3 is 12, 2 times 3 is 6. So because 1 and 4 twelfths is between 1 and 3 twelfths and 1 and 6 twelfths, we know that that fraction is in the shaded part of the number line, so we have 1 and 1 third. Next, we need to look at 1 and 1 fifth, but again we have quarters. Now 20 is in both the 4 and the 5 times table, so to, co so to compare these fractions, we can convert them to twentieths. One fifth is the same as four twentieths, because 5 times 4 is 20, 1 times 4 is 4. But 1 and 1 quarter is the same as 1 and 5 twentieths, because 4 times 5 is 20, 1 times 5 is 5. So that means 1 and 1 fifth must be smaller than 1 and 1 quarter, because 1 and 1 fifth is only equivalent to, to 1 and 4 twentieths, so we don't want to circle 1 and 1 fifth. Jamie draws a triangle. He says, two of the three angles in my triangle are obtuse. Explain why Jamie cannot be correct. So we need to remember that angles in a triangle must add up to 180 degrees. But obtuse angles are larger than 90 degrees. So if you have two angles which are larger than 90 degrees, you will have more than 180. But there can't be more than 180 degrees in a triangle. So a triangle can only have at most one obtuse angle. You can't have a triangle with two obtuse angles because that would add up to more than 180.